Hey, hey folks, thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe um, in all the usual guy. places. Hey folks, uh, welcome to the podcast. Um, we've got a great guy um, today. We had a really brilliant chat. This guy called Gilad Amir. Uh, we've known each other for quite a while now, and he is all things fintech. And so he's um, started businesses, he's an entrepreneur, uh, he's done a lot of experience in the financial services industry. Uh, he knows a lot about fintech, entrepreneurship, uh, what it takes to start a fintech business, grow it, raise cash, um, M&A, all of that kind of stuff. So we talk a lot about that. So I hope you enjoy it. Hey, it's Lewis. Welcome to the podcast. Enjoy our conversations anytime, anywhere. Perfect. I'm alive. Um, thanks, Gilad, for joining me. Thanks for having me. A pleasure. How are you doing? Uh, great. A bit wet. <laughs> it was a little bit wet. <laughs> yeah, Hopefully it's not the end of the summer yet. But. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully we still have a few days of shiny weather. I think yeah. so. Be fun. So uh, tell us what you do. So I'm a, I'm a fintech entrepreneur. Um, I'm currently building new ventures for one of the leading private equity funds in Europe. Awesome. And I'm also a, a non-executive director with the Miris Group that is developing the next generation of funding of green projects through blockchain. Wow. So for example? So uh, Miris Group is a group of uh, real estate entrepreneurs that have been building real estate, okay. traditional real estate project in Norway. At some point they realized that they want to focus on, on green projects and they thought that they should be utilizing blockchain as the platform to which they will develop the next generation of funding for, for real estate projects. Nice. Ah, so specifically for funding for these? Yes. Interesting. And then your private equity firm? What did you guys look to invest in? And so the private equity fund I'm, fund I'm working with is one of the leading funds in Europe in the financial services space, focusing, specializing in financial services. And we look at new opportunities, um, trying to tap into some of the market trends uh, of the back of open banking, blockchain, Great. And, and, and so on. And this is Europe specifically? Or? Yes, UK and Europe. Great. Yeah. And how'd you get in, how did you get into this? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I would say luck. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you but it's not always. It's just network and yeah, yeah. network and opportunity. Yeah. So you started. So what did you do at university? How did like the journey come about? And um. So I would start from from the start. So I'm a. I guess that I'm a math geek, that accidentally found himself serving in the infantry for a few years and then. Uh, going to uni, studying accounting and economics, um, and then I joined Ernst & Young to the high-tech and M&A practice. Had been doing audit and M&A for, for a few years. Okay. And had, I really had the privilege to learn, for, learn from and, and work with some of the brightest minds in the space. Great. At some point I realized that as much as I, I love, if I can use the word love for auditing, but yes, as much as I love auditing and, and, and M&A, um, I think that my, I realized that my passion was elsewhere. So it's really to try and, and, and utilize and harness technologies to improve the financial, the, the financial supply chain or the financial value chain, if right. I can put it this way, yeah. um, which was fragmented, inefficient, expensive, and I'm talking about the year 2003. Right, okay? fine, so, yeah. so enough years ago. And, and the supply chain being from, uh, from consumer to bank and everything in between? Well, the financial value chain, right? right. So including so the assets, um, asset management, wealth, credit, lending, okay. SMEs, consumers, treasury, cash management, yeah. payments, Bitcoin. Yeah. And Is that around back in, the, in 2003? So um, the first time I've looked at Bitcoin was in 2011, 12. Yeah. Okay, back then it was just way too volatile and yeah, too yeah. anarchist in a way. Okay, so yeah. I skipped. I looked at it for a while and at some point I decided that uh, I think there is still enough work to be done in, if I can use the term, traditional fintech space. Right, fine. And, um, and then have been doing fintech since 2003. In 2008, 
I, I took a two years break from my fintech journey. I've joined Insightix as the, as the turnaround CFO um, at the request of one of the VCs. We turned around the company. I worked with the management team, uh, completed a turnaround. We sold the company to McAfee and in 2000 and yeah. end of 2011, I returned to my, uh, my fintech obsession, I would, I would say. Nice. Uh, moved to London at some point, joined, uh, I joined the Lloyd Banking Group as the head of fintech of the group. Yeah. And Well, how was that? So from startup entrepreneurship to uh, Bitsy 100, big. <laughs> um, so first of all, it's a, it's a, it was a huge privilege, huge privilege because you know, as a, as a, I would say even an immigrant, yes. Yeah. Um, you know, joining Lloyd at such a senior position, and working so closely with decision makers across the group, and and having this opportunity to be involved in, in some of the more advanced processes, thinking, experiments, um, in such a in such a massive group, that was that was a real privilege, and and also to for someone like myself that has been trying to change this industry, um, having this rare opportunity to understand how things work on the other side yeah, and, yeah. and mainly to, to meet so many wonderful people that are generally trying to change, change things and, and change things for, for, for the best, um, I think, within the system, right? So that was very interesting for me, eye-opening. I think that, you know, for someone like me, having this opportunity to, to get this 60,000 feet view of the yeah. industry, yeah. Um, it, it was very useful. And, and I think that also it gave me, helped me, the, I think, evolve my, my view of where the opportunities are in the fintech space. Okay. Um, and actually, I would even say how, close banks are to close some of the gaps or perceived gaps that fintech and other big tech players think banks have so actually oh, so they do quite a bit so so i think that i cannot refer specifically to lloyds but i think that if we think of the big four in the uk yeah, yeah. the big nine i think that uh much closer than what the average fintech practitioner think right yeah, because you always look at big banks and think they're quite slow moving and hard to change and from the outside. Uh, Is that, that's not true? Uh, I, I don't think it's true. Look, they're subject to very different set of, of rules and, and risk and governance frameworks. I think that but they also have a very different perspective as to what good looks like and what customers really want. Okay, so as yeah. a fintech entrepreneur, I can identify an opportunity that may be interesting for a sub-segment of customers uh, and, and could potentially be successful in this specific, within this specific segment. But as a big bank, you have a very different perspective. We think of, of the big four that serves tens of millions of customers. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and, and you know, even a successful bank with, with, a, with a significant transformation budget would always need to prioritize. Yeah. So, yeah. So, and, and banks serve the, the masses. They don't serve niches. They may, but True. broadly yeah. speaking, they, they serve the mass, yeah. okay? So these new FinTech digital banks have what, only got a few hundred thousand users, presumably at the moment. Nothing like the, uh, the big banks and... So I, I, I don't have the, the exact numbers, but I think that other than, than N26 and, uh, and Revolut, I think that all the challenger banks are sub, one million have right. some yeah, sub yeah. one million yeah. users. I think yeah. that Monzo maybe yeah. have seven hundred k. Okay. Okay, and and all the rest have sub half million. Right. Okay. Okay. Which which yeah. is a it, it's a nice number in terms of proof of concept. Yes. Yeah. It's not a very exciting number in terms of the of of imposing any threat on the on the big four. Yeah. yeah. At least at least in the UK. Yeah. Fine. And how how do you see the fintech sector? Or has it been evolving? over the, the last five or so years? Uh, uh, that, that's an interesting question. Um, so I, I think that it started with the hype, as always, okay? because suddenly, you know, this old, boring industry that was dominated by incumbent banks, 
suddenly have this shiny toy, these new capabilities where you can submit an application in minutes and get an answer within minutes. And, yeah. and if you're approved, you get a loan within minutes or hours rather than weeks. Yeah. So, so I think that was interesting. I think that following the hype, there was a, a painful acknowledgement. And I think that if we look at the last report of the, of the World Economic Forum, and, and they put it nicely, they, they described FinTech as not changing the competitive landscape, but changing the, the basis of competition, which is a nice way to put it, yeah. right? So FinTechs just raise the bar, they just show what is possible, yeah. okay? Yeah. At, least, at least conceptually, between what FinTechs can demonstrate, uh, I would say on a, on a POC or, or just a proof of concept level to, to the ability to actually deploy some of those capabilities at scale for the masses, there are some gaps yeah, that yeah. I think that as an industry we, we still struggle with. Okay, so if we look at this fintech banks partnership and how and which model we work best, so I don't think that I cannot think of a, a very good example. BBVA maybe, ING maybe, but even them are still are still in the journey. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, but but most banks are still struggling with with finding the right model to, to work with FinTech and, and harness their innovation and their, the new capabilities they bring to the table at scale and, 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 and deploying it and rolling out at scale. So you're seeing that the, the, actually the big banks are looking at, at working out ways of how to work with these FinTechs rather than seeing them as competition? Well, FinTechs were never a competition, to be honest. Never. It just, you know, it's... it's when, every time, even, even when I was doing FinTech in the early days, so every time I read an article about, about the track, track that FinTech imposed to banks, I, I look at it and say, look, that's just a nice article that one of the VCs or angel investors or, or, or founders managed to, to, to push through this specific uh, medium. But FinTech was never a threat. How can FinTech be a threat? In what sense? So if you're a big bank and you think that this small company has an interesting technology that can turn into a threat, you simply buy the company. Yeah. It's as simple as that. Yeah. Why, why would it be a threat? Okay, so th there are other threats, I yeah. think. So if we think of Amazon, PayPal, blockchain in the long run, open banking, so uh, there are uh, other threats. Talk, talk me about blockchain. How do you see that being a threat over the, the long term? So, uh, the, the, so blockchain as a distributed ledger um, turn broadly speaking, right? Because there are different use cases and, and different segments and verticals, but bro conceptually, blockchain uh, turn intermediaries redundant. So blockchain remove the need for intermediaries, yeah. which means that to a large extent, it turn the, the financial services industry obsolete, okay? And if we think of blockchain as, as the enabler to unlock the true potential of P2P, so then the yeah. question is, what will be the future role of banks? Again, it, it will take probably 10 to 15 years, right. but at some point it will happen. At some point, there will be a tipping... Ten years isn't long. Uh, depends who, but yeah. yes. Yeah. Uh, yes, in, in the banking world, no. It's not, it's not, it's not, uh, it's not the far future. Yeah, yeah. Long term, but yes. Yeah. It's in a sense, around the corner. Yes, yeah. And, and the big banks aren't trying to work out ways to use blockchain? And of course they are, all of them. And how are they getting on? Well, I'm, well I'm, I don't think I'm in a position to represent the state of the industry, but from what I know, from what I hear from my peers, from yeah. what I hear in conferences, I think that most banks are in a pretty, have a pretty good understanding of, of the opportunity and threats. So most of them have been experimenting with blockchain and, and more broadly with DLTs. Distributing large technologies, yeah, yeah. okay, looking at the, at the use cases around payments, mortgages, identity, um, cross-border payments, um, I think that uh, cross-border um, trading, and, and I think that most of them have a pretty good idea of what they should do to, or, or have been trying to join or have already joined one of the consortiums. So if we, if we look at IBM and some of the other, and R3, and some of the other um, activities that we see in the space, um, 
so I, I think that I think that banks well understand that uh, it's it's really inevitable. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure that they have a clear strategy around what would be their the long-term strategic answer to P2P and a decentralized banking world. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but I think that in the short term, at least for the specific use cases that were already identified, uh, most of them have a pretty good idea of what they want to do. Great. And where would, the, where would digital currencies fit into this? Sorry, again? Where would digital currencies fit into this? So the blockchain, Ethereum? Um, well, I'm not sure. That's a tough question. I'm, I'm not sure. I th I, there is a clear appetite by, by investors and by institutional investors. I think that they do expect banks to provide custodian services, yep. so that that's clear. Do you think it's inevitable that we'll be we'll be using these types of things? Um, yes, and I think that banks could play an important role in in offering banking services in the new crypto world. Yeah. Okay. Mainly around custodian services and, and insurance and. And, and, and cyber security and, and so on. Yeah, yeah. Fine, so I'll hold on to my Ethereum, which crashed um, <laughs> a few months ago. Yes, please do. <laughs> I will, I will. Um, interesting. And do you look much, I know you cover most of Europe, but are you seeing some of these things take off quite quickly in places like Africa, where you know a lot of people have a lot of mobile phones and mobile banking, and you know because we're very mature in the UK and in Europe. Do you see some of these like fintechs and um, innovative ways of banking taking off faster in Africa? Yeah, yes, absolutely. So if we think of, uh, I think that's Dala, it's the name Dala, the right. Dala Foundation and Walla. Right. So they've they've launched uh, uh, essentially a, a well, I would say, a decentralized banking proposition. So it's a it's a mobile wallet coupled with payments and and a designated currency. Uh, that was launched less than a year ago and already onboarded, I think, more than 100k customers. Nice. But maybe I'm wrong, maybe much more than that. This okay, is so Africa. they were in Africa, so they've, they've been growing uh, exponentially. Amazing. And uh, yes, it, it is amazing, and that's just one nice example, the others. Um, and, and I think that, again, if I, ignoring, ignoring blockchain and open banking for a second, I think that the opportunities in the fintech world lies in the are uh, exist in the developing world and not in the western world i, I don't see right. many strategic opportunities in the western world interesting and but i see i think that the emerging markets africa latin america to, to a certain extent uh, asia so there are some it, it's it's really a blue ocean there are Amazing. so many interesting opportunities really? to explore yeah and if we think, if we think of the western world so Again, if we think of open banking, PSD2, and, uh, and blockchain, yeah. so these are strategic enablers, transformational enablers for, for the next waves of fintechs. Yeah, interesting. And then is your fund looking at Africa now? Uh, no. Not yet. Not yet, that's the best answer, I think. Not yet, good. So who's funding these, these startups, these fintechs in, in developing countries? Um, so in, in, in the Western world, so in... Europe and, and the US think that we, we could see a transition from angel investors to VCs and now we see more and more CVCs, so the venture arm, the investment arm of, of banks yeah. that, right. uh, that invest more and more in, in fintechs and, yeah. and I think that also the, the, the mix changed from early stage companies to more mature companies, so I think that um, in general we, we, we could see an increase in investment in fintech but I wouldn't be surprised if, if we look if we take a harder look at the numbers, we realize that actually there was a decrease in the investment in early stage fintechs that that that, that are focused on building proposition for the Western world or in the Western world. Interesting. For what reason? Because I think that investors are much more aware of the challenges around building a company in the financial services space. So. It's a heavily regulated space, and the customer acquisition costs are uh, higher than expected. And I think that most fintech entrepreneurs underestimated uh, the loyalty of the average consumer or SME to their 
uh, incumbent banks or that to yeah. their banking providers. Yeah. And and it's challenging to secure funding and it's challenging to se it's challenging to secure debt. And and again, there are some exceptions. Obviously, in the payment space, we still see interesting opportunities and fast-growing companies, cross-border payments, forex, remittances. So there are some, I would say, tactical opportunities. Yeah. Um, I think that the next unicorns would probably evolve out of the open banking and and blockchain. Because right. um, Revolut's done really well. I, th I think so. Yes. Great. I think we're valued at a billion. I think that that, that but it but Revolut is Revolut. I think that. One of the reasons they've been doing so well is because they have an exceptional CEO. So I think that, I think that the way he, run the com he runs the company and, and the way he, ex he executes is, is something that we could all learn from. Interesting. That's an interesting question because um, looking at if, if firms have the right talent and what type of talent is going to be relevant for the future is quite an interesting question. Do you see that, that changing? The types of the types of people that are going to be attracted to financial services, their backgrounds. Um, there seems to be quite a big war for like data scientists and you know, these types of people in banks now. Um, so there is, you know, talent and access to talent is always a challenge. Okay, and as you grow the company and as you as you uh, face new challenges, you always need more people, more good people to help you in the journey. And, and you increasingly focusing on recruiting good people that will help you build and run the company. Um, I don't think that there is a specific challenge in, in attracting talents to financial services. So talents look for the right place to express themselves yeah. and be effective and experience success. And I, I think that, that that applies for financial services as much as it could apply to any other industry. Yeah, but you you, are, you have seen recently. I've seen recently that um, really t top talent is being pursued by the tech firms, the Amazons, the Googles, etc. And there now seems to be a little bit of a of a fight back from financial services firms. Um, so, for example, scrapping dress codes, being more relaxed, um, flexible working. So there does seem to be this, you know, this kind of war for for talent from the tech firms and the banks, which I found been quite interesting. Um, yes, and, and not surprising because I think that once banks realize, so if you think of Goldman Sachs, JB Morgan, and the new technologies they're building, so if we think of Marcus and we think of of some of the work they're doing in the in the blockchain space, so and, and AI, obviously, yeah. AI yeah, yeah, yeah. is a uh, which we haven't spoken about. Yeah, we will. Yes. Anyway. <laughs> so you know, you need to have the right people to build those, those new technologies and new platforms and new and new enablers, right? Yeah. Um, and some of those people currently work for, for GAFA, so. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah? Yeah. So if you pay more and or offer a more attractive working environment where they can express themselves, they will join. Yeah. And some very interesting complex problems as well. Yes, definitely. In financial services. Yeah, yeah. It's very interesting. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, and now they're getting, uh, banks are getting cooler. Um, people want to work there. Um, yes. Because ultimately, you know, the, the number one place to work is in a really cool firm with big complex problems to solve, um, like a Tesla or Google. And now as banks start to get a little bit more over to that, that side, I think they'll find it, they'll attract people back. I agree. Back. I agree. I, I could do the same. Yeah. yeah. We talked a bit about AI before we, uh, before we started recording. Um, mostly around Google, listening to all of our phone, all of our conversations. Um, where is that fitting in? We uh, shouldn't speak too loudly. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, what's the place for AI in uh, in financial services now? Um, everywhere and anywhere. I don't think there is there will be any any segment or any area in the financial services space that won't be that won't have AI. Or we'll be using AI in this form or another, in this way or another. Um, so if we think of the use cases of AI, so we could think of RPA and how we can automate processes. What's up, RPA is? It's a, a robotic processing automation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So automate processes and and reduce the the number of people and the cost of labor yeah. that is involved in the manual processes. So so replace humans with machines yeah. and by that 
improving the cost to income ratio, so improving the profitability. And, and I think that in the other, and so we can think of RPA as, as, a, as a very good way to decrease costs and to better manage risks. Yeah. And, and also I think that uh, we will see, we, we don't see it yet, but we will see uh, more and more banks and financial institutions using AI to, to build hyper personalized propositions. Okay. Yeah. So to use the data they have and to use AI to, uh, to optimize the cross and upsell opportunities they have, yeah. okay? As, as we see with Amazon, as we see with Facebook, yes. as we see with yeah. Google, okay? Yeah. So they will do the same, yeah. okay? And, and they can do the same because they have the data. Yeah. And if you use the data and, and you shift your mindset from a transactional mode to a uh, I would say relational, relational mode where you, you actually look at the customer and better understand the customer and, and build proper customer profiles. So banks can do very interesting things and they will already doing. Yeah. Or and, they, building. and hopefully they can also help us more. So with personal finance, 100%. people saving better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's given. Oh, that's a given. That, that, yeah, yeah, 100%. So, so that's the only way for banks to stay relevant. Yeah. Okay. And and to turn into the, the trusted financial advisor or yes, financial yeah. assistant, yeah. okay, for both for consumers and SMEs. So our trusted financial advisor is going to be an AI, a robot. Um, yes, yes, definitely, definitely. Yeah. And I think that if, if we think of the, this decentralized banking world that will be enabled by blockchain, yeah. so I think that would be one of the opportunities for, for banks in yeah. 10 to 15 years. Yeah, interesting. Um, thank you very much for, uh, for joining me. Pleasure. And good luck with all of your investments. Hey folks, thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe in all the usual places. <laughs>